my name is Maarten Hart. This is my first YouTube movie about the Genesis Flood. On the web I'm known as Geodetective and I will tell you something about heat during the flood. Is heat a problem or an answer? This presentation has five chapters. We will begin with heat in flood models as a problem. There are many flood models available, but they all have one problem in common. They have too much heat involved. Let me give two examples. The impact model of Michael Ord and the catastrophic plate tectonics model of John Baumgartner. First the impact model. Take a look at the moon or at Mars. These are two height maps for example. And you'll notice a lot of craters. And even on Earth we find craters. Michael Ord says that if we extrapolate from the moon how many craters there should be on Earth, he says there should be 36,000 of them on Earth with a diameter of 30 km or larger. That's because there are more than 1,000 of those on the moon and the impact chance of the Earth is 19 times larger. And since all of the bodies in the solar system show craters, the Earth could not have been missed. Critics say, though, that such a bombardment would sterilize the planet. John Baumgartner says in his model, this is the Earth we have today, but this is what the Earth looked like before the flood. So he says the continents moved during the flood. And also critics say, a sudden exposure of the mantle to 70% of Earth's surface would release enough heat to boil the oceans dry several times. Hence the heat problem for Genesis flood models. But next, let's do some calculations. Let's see how much heat is involved here. It is very well possible to calculate the heat involved in the crater formation. We'll take the famous Chicxulub crater for an example. This crater is supposedly the impact that killed the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. This is an illustration of the real size of the fireball that would be formed during such a large impact. If you would stand anywhere here that is visible in this image, you'd be dead. If you zoom out, it would look like this. Still devastating, yet it shows you could survive at larger distances. Let's take some parameters for creating a crater this size. Note that there are other sets of parameters possible that result in the same crater size. In this case we take a meteorite with a diameter of 18 kilometers, a speed of 17 kilometers per second and a density of 3000 kilograms per cubic meter, which is basically rock. This results in a crater of 170 kilometers in diameter. The impact energy involved is 1.3 times 10 to the 24th power joules. For comparison, we're going to look at the largest nuclear explosion test in history, which is the Tsar Bomba. It released 2.1 times 10 to the 17th power joules. This is what the bomb looked like, and the test was performed in Nova Zembla, releasing a mushroom cloud reaching up 64 kilometers high. This caused even window shattering in northern Finland. This single bomb released a lot more energy than all bombs in both world wars combined. But nobody got killed. Now let's get back to the impact. As you can see, the impact is like detonating 6 million nuclear bombs all over the world at once. Well, not exactly. It is the amount of energy released, but at one single spot. And that matters. It's also the same amount of energy as what would be involved in an earthquake of 12.9 on the Richter scale. There's this nice calculator online that can calculate some effects of an impact. Of course there are some uncertainties, because we have never actually witnessed an impact this size, but it's good enough to get an idea. The fireball in this impact would have a diameter of 140 kilometers. At first it would be a transient crater forming with a diameter of 110 km and a humongous depth of 36 km. Gravity does not allow such a large hole, so it collapses upward, forming a final crater, which is larger, but not that deep. Also, a large tsunami forms, depending on whether this impacted water or not. Also, an earthquake, which is 10.3 on the Richter scale for this impact, and an air blast that would be 3 bars at 1000 km distance. 
and for the record, one bar is the normal atmospheric pressure. The air blast is strongly non-linearly related to the distance from the crater, so farther away you would be able to survive this. And it would be a melt layer of one kilometer thick. Notice that only a very small portion of the energy converts in an earthquake. The vast majority of the energy converts into heat that ends up inside the earth. Let's take a look at the melt. During an impact, melt forms here. But also simulations show there could also be decompression melt happening deeper over here. I could be a little bit off with this image, but it doesn't matter that much. Because deep melt seems to be happening, I just don't know exactly where. Let's calculate a second example. We're going to calculate the energy involved in an impact causing a 1000 km diameter crater. That's huge, but remember we do find craters like that on the moon and other planets. Here you see formulas for calculating the energy in an impact. We're going to keep the speed and density of the meteorite the same as for the previous example. In that case you would need a meteorite with a diameter of 221 kilometers. The energy involved in this impact is 4.12 times 10 to the 26th joules. To calculate Michael Oort's impact scenario, we would have to make a sum for a lot of craters, ranging from 30 kilometers up to 5000 kilometers in diameter. The largest would have 1 times 10 to the 29th joules. Notice that B is 158,000 times more powerful than A, and C is 244 times more powerful than B. Michael Oort says there should be 36,000 craters larger than 30 kilometers, 100 craters larger than 1,000 kilometers, and possibly two craters of about 4,000 or 5,000 kilometer in diameter. I'm going to leave the largest two out because it is statistically acceptable that these did not happen. Scaling the craters up from 30 to over 1000 kilometers using a formula and adding up the energy results in a total amount of energy of 6.7 times 10 to the 29th joules. If we would include the larger craters, this would be closer to 10. Given all the uncertainties, I would suggest the range of energy involved is somewhere between 4 and 15. This would be unsurvivable. However, as I show in my other presentation about the solar system, it seems that the majority of impacts happened on one side of the planet. I think it would be what is now the Pacific side. So the image on the left is the impact side, and the image on the right is the less impacted side. But I also think the continents used to be like this, so this is closer to the scenario I have in mind. Okay, huge amounts of energy, so I see why people say this is a problem. But let's take a look at the Earth as it is today. If we take a look inside the Earth, we have reasonable data which indicates that the interior of the Earth is very hot. The deeper you go, the hotter it gets. The core of the Earth is even more than 5000 degrees Celsius. It's there, it's hot, and we don't have a problem with the heat. So heat is not automatically a problem. Based on today's knowledge, we can actually calculate how much heat energy is involved inside the Earth today. It's not perfect, but we can get a close approximation. For this calculation, we need heat capacity. Heat capacity is a property of a material which describes how much heat energy a specific material can hold. The unit is joules per kilogram kelvin. Joules is energy, kilograms is mass, and kelvin is temperature. Mass is density times volume, and kelvin is the same as Celsius, only differing in that kelvin starts with absolute cold is zero kelvin, while Celsius goes down to minus 273 degrees. Let's take some examples. Iron has a heat capacity of 450 joules per kilogram kelvin. Water has almost 10 times as much. Granite has 190 and olivine 723. Why these materials? Well, iron is inside the Earth's core, water is at the surface, granite is in the crust and olivine is the main component of the mantle. If we want to know the amount of heat energy, we must multiply heat capacity with temperature, density and volume. 
the density of the interior of the Earth is fairly well known, thanks to seismic interpretation. The temperature holds some more uncertainties, but still there is little doubt that it would be significantly different. Since the density, material and temperatures differs per depth of the Earth, I have divided the Earth into 1 km thick shells, calculated the heat energy per shell, and then I've added up the shells to get the answer. The volume of such a shell is the volume of a sphere, minus the volume of a sphere that has a radius of 1 km less. And the result of this calculation is about 1 times 10 to the power of 31. If we compare that to the total amount of heat energy involved in microorts impacts, we see that the impact energy is only about 6.5% compared to the heat energy inside the Earth. Because of the uncertainties, this could range from somewhere between 4% and 15%, but not more than that. So technically, the impacts do not produce too much heat, if there is a reason that it ended up inside the Earth. Now let's take a look at what does heat actually do. And take a look at the statement we saw earlier. A sudden exposure of the mantle to 70% of the Earth's surface would release enough heat energy to boil the oceans dry several times. This is comparable to the statement, your oven has enough energy to set your curtains on fire. They are not on fire, so you don't have an oven. For comparison, the Tsar bomb released more energy than all weapons and bombs in all wars combined, yet nobody got killed. So two things are important. It's not only the amount of energy that is involved that matters, but also the heat transport. In other words, where is the heat? So heat transport then. How do we get the impact heat from here to there? Basically, there are only three ways to do that. Heat flow, conduction and thermal radiation. If none of these is available, the heat stays where it is. Flow is like this. You have a liquid or a gas that is hot and a material moves. So this is flow and this is no flow. Conduction. Conduction is heat transport by material that is touching each other. So consider we have a hot material touching a cold material in a closed environment and the material doesn't move. After a while, all this material will have a medium temperature. So this is a good conductor and this is a bad conductor. Radiation. Radiation is heat transport by emitting light. If it's very hot, it can be red, yellow or even white. But usually we don't see it because the majority is infrared light. So this is a good radiator and this is a bad radiator. So technically it's possible to trap heat, like heat inside the earth. Let's take a random example. Assume we have a large piece of rock and suddenly parts of this rock gets molten for some reason. It expands a little and now let's add water to it. And let's assume the rock contains enough heat to boil all this water away. So the water then starts to boil at some point, and the lava is starting to cool down. The lava sinks slowly, causing some places where hot rock goes upward. And after a while a solid layer forms on top of this molten rock, and then eventually we would have a situation where a solid layer isolates the hot molten rock from the water. So we'd end up with trapped heat and still a lot of water on top. So for all the oceans to evaporate, all heat must end up in the ocean, which does not happen. You see, it's possible to touch freshly solidified lava with your shoes shortly without them catching fire. For your own safety, I highly recommend not to do this, but it is possible. So let's take a look at what would happen if continents shift quickly, exposing hot mental material. Say the left is South America, and the middle part is lava, but this is what is going to be the Atlantic Ocean, and the right is Africa. The lava is lighter than the solid rock, so it expands. Not only does this boil the ocean away there, but it also pushes the ocean away there because of the expansion. The result is that it would start to rain like crazy in colder areas, and that is on the continents. So we would have a situation where the ocean is flooding the continents, 
and the lava has a lot of freedom to expose its heat to the sky and the universe. At the edge of the continents, the water touches the hot lava, enhancing the solidification process there. Because it solidifies, it shrinks and becomes denser than the continents, so it leaves more room for the water there. The molten lava is being squeezed out horizontally and wants to flow on top of the solidified lava. But there is water there so it also starts to solidify. So the water is slowly pushing the molten lava towards the middle and eventually two layers of solidified lava lean on each other and this causes a closing seam, a closing midpoint, which we identify today as a mid-oceanic ridge. When it comes to thermal radiation, we can actually calculate how long this would take. For that we need to use the Stefan Boltzmann law. And the result of this formula is energy per time. You get it by multiplying some constant value with the emissivity, the area and the temperature. But the temperature is in the fourth power in this formula, resulting in a tremendous nonlinear process. So the answer is in watts or joules per second. And Stefan's constant is a very small number. The emissivity is a property of the material. We are going to calculate this for basalt, which is what the oceanic floor is made of. The area is in square meters and the temperature is in kelvins. Let's give an example first. If we would have one cubic meter of basalt being exposed for only one square meter, how long would it take to solidify? And like I said, it strongly depends on the temperature. If it would cool down from 2000 Kelvin to 1900 Kelvin, it would take 399 seconds, which is about 7 minutes. From 1000 to 900 Kelvin, it takes about 2 hours. From 300 to 200 Kelvins, it takes about 20 days. And from 100 to 0, it takes forever. It will never reach 0. So this is very strongly nonlinear. Now assume we have two blocks of rock. They are made of the same material, they are equally thick and they are only exposed at the top. But one of these blocks is a lot larger than the other, which would cool down faster. If we use both the formula for heat capacity and the Stephen Boltzmann law, we see that the area plays a role in both. More area means more heat capacity in a linear way, but more area means more thermal radiation also in a linear way. This means that in the end, for the cooling down time, area isn't relevant, it's the thickness that matters. So we can make the formulas a little bit simpler. And now we can calculate the thermal radiation for a scenario. What if the entire oceanic crust was molten at the same time? How long would it take to solidify? We use these variables. The thickness of the oceanic crust is about 7 km on average and we use temperatures that are normal for molten lava, which is a starting temperature of 1600 degrees Celsius and a solidification temperature of 1000 degrees Celsius. For this calculation it is better to integrate the Stefan Boltzmann law to get accurate results. Since the temperature is so high, the energy emission is huge. Remember, the temperature is in the fourth power. It takes one year and 150 days to solidify. So not billions of years, not millions of years, not even thousands of years, only one and a half year. Well, almost. Because the solidifying process itself also releases energy. This is called latent heat fusion. But also this takes only 2.3 years. So if we would melt the entire oceanic crust at once, it takes only 3.7 years to solidify using thermal radiation alone. Water enhances this solidification process, so we are actually very much in the right order of magnitude for the Genesis Flood. If you see my other presentation about the solar system, you see that the evolutionary timescale for things like the moon are very far off. When a crust is solidified, it's still quite hot, about a thousand degrees Celsius. Then conduction takes over for the cooling down process. We can also calculate this. We have a formula that says that heat conduction per time is the thermal conductivity times the area 
times the temperature difference on both sides of the material divided by the thickness of the layer. To do this properly, we must divide the materials up in smaller layers because each of these layers have their own temperature and thus they have their own amount of heat energy and their own conduction speed. All these layers give their energy to their neighbors and only the top layers releases that energy to cool the whole lot down. So we start with a lot of layers that are 1000 degrees Celsius each, except for the top layer, which is a room temperature. Remember, there's water on top, which consumes a lot of heat. The layers are 50 meters thick each, and we're using a time interval of about 100 days to calculate the conductivity step by step. And we represent the temperature with colors. Red is 1000 degrees Celsius, yellow is 500, and green is 20. Here we display a layer of 7 kilometers thick. This is what it looks like after 90 years, 1000 years, 2000 years, 3000 years, 4000 years, and let's stop at 4500 years. If we are looking at the Genesis flood, it could be that this is close to the time that has passed since. There are uncertainties of when the flood year was, which is a subject for another discussion, but let's just see what the result is after 4,500 years. In this scenario, all would have cooled down and we would find the maximum of 590 degrees Celsius at 4,700 meters depth. Remember, we still have a lot of volcanic areas, which are in the basaltic oceanic crust, so conductivity is happening there. Since these are still hot today and only a few kilometers depth, it means these volcanic areas could not be millions of years old. This calculation shows that it can only stay hot for thousands of years. Now when it comes to heat there are some pretty weird phenomena that come into play. One is a thermocline. You may wonder how fish could survive such a scenario. Let's say we have regions with hot water and regions with cold water. Then there are also places where the hot water flows on top of the cold water. The hot water kills the fishes. Yes, we find a lot of dead fish in the geologic layers. And the fishes in the cold water can survive. The hot water is less dense than the cold water. This causes that hot and cold water don't mix very well. This causes a separation between hot and cold water layers. And this separation is called a thermocline. Important for fishes, but you don't need that information for the rest of this presentation. Now the next issue is power law creep. Power law creep is a process that causes rock to become viscous without increase in temperature. How do you do that? Well, let's assume we have several layers of rock, we put pressure on it, and we are going to push the top layer sideways. That is called shear stress. Then the middle layer will start to deform. In other words, it changes shape. Now if you put a gigantic shear stress on the top layer, the layer below dramatically changes shape. This process is very strongly nonlinear and has something to do with molecular structures breaking up and crystalline surfaces sliding on top of each other. It's very complex but it has been tested in the laboratory. You can compare this with toothpaste. Toothpaste is solid until you put pressure on it, then it changes shape but it will become solid again as soon as the pressure stops. This process reduces the viscosity of the rock up to 14 orders of magnitude and thus it's very strongly non-linear. In very extreme conditions, solid rock can flow like water without increasing temperature. This phenomenon plays a very big role in John Baumgartner's catastrophic plate tectonics model. The last weird phenomenon I'm going to show you is the crossover depth. We are used to magma rising up because molten material has a lower density than the same material in solid state. But it appears that molten rock is better compressible than solid rock. So if you put a lot of pressure on lava, it will eventually become more dense than the solid rock. So magma that is very deep inside the earth sinks. The point where the switches from rising to sinking is called the crossover depth. Depending on a rock type, the point where this happens is between 200 and 400 kilometers. This phenomenon has also been confirmed by multiple laboratory experiments. And very importantly, it shows that magma cannot come from deeper than 400 kilometers. The crossover depth is about here. 
As a side note, I know about this crossover depth thanks to Walt Brown. Walt Brown also has a flood model, the Hydroplate Theory. I think there are too many errors in the model to be correct as a well, whole, but Walt Brown certainly has some good points and this crossover depth is one of them. And the fourth chapter of this presentation is about how this all fits into one model. What I think that happened is that large impacts plus the crossover depth plus power law creep is catastrophic plate tectonics. Ok, so we have this very heavy meteorite bombardment on one side of the earth. Let's take a look at different cratering scenarios. I'm going to keep impact speed the same and the material the same, but I'm going to illustrate scenarios with different sizes of the meteorite. If we have one small impact, with the meteorite smaller than 200 meters, we get a transient crater that collapses into a simple crater. This collapses outward. If the impact is larger, the uprising of the transient crater goes like crazy. Just like when you throw a rock in the water, you get a splash. Something similar happens to this large transient crater, causing a central uplift in the middle. This is called a complex crater. So it still collapses outward, but it has a central uplift in the middle. If we're going to make the meteorite even larger, say about 100 kilometers in diameter, we will get a scenario where part of the melt of the impact ends up below the crossover depth. Now here's where things get interesting. Now still the Earth wants to become a sphere again, but there is this little bit of magma that is disturbing the nice process of outward collapsing. Instead, this magma sinks. As it sinks, magma on top of it also goes deeper. So it will start sucking magma into the Earth. The top layer will solidify, below it it will be a large blob of magma and then eventually the heat sink pipe will be jammed by colder rock. And then the process stops. The large blob is a hotspot and the solidified layer will become what we call a large igneous province. So in this scenario the whole lot starts to deform drastically. Now let's go for a huge isolated impact. In this scenario the majority of the melt ends up below the crossover depth. This causes the majority of the melt to go down and it will drag basically all of the melt downward. The only thing that can fill up the gap is the surrounding solid rock. This will crumble and form a lot of mountains on top of it and almost all the melt will just sink away. So we won't find a crater, because it collapses inward instead of outward. Now what would happen if we would have a complete bombardment with one huge meteorite at the edge of this bombardment? In this scenario water will also play a role, as the water would end up on the non-impacted side. Water will enhance the solidifying process, causing a heavy layer on top of one side. The melt of the smaller impacts will flow into the large hole of the large impact. So this causes the whole lot at the large impact to be heavy below the crossover depth because of molten magma, but also heavy above the crossover depth because of solidifying magma. This causes the drag to be faster here than anywhere else in the world. Again, it is the solid crust that must close up the cap, and we would find a solidified plate diving underneath this solid crumbled crust. This would result in what we know today as a subduction area. So this would also be an inward collapse with a lot of shifting and sinking. The large impact could also happen in the middle of the bombardment. Then we would also have lava flowing in, but from all sides, causing rapid subduction, but in a way the plates from all sides would flow in. This is known as a convergent plate boundary. So also an inward collapse, but with a shape that shows liquids played a role. Now this shows that the larger the impact, the more the heat tends to end up inside the earth. All this mass would also do something to the unimpacted side. Because the impact causes a shift on both sides of the unimpacted side, and the crust will be exposed to a lot of stress. This causes the crust to be ruptured apart. This fills up with lava and causes a mid-oceanic ridge, which I showed earlier. So that gives seven different features that we could find on Earth. Simple craters, complex craters, large igneous provinces with a hotspot, orogeny or a mountain area, subduction area, convergent plate boundary and a continental rupture. And this is when we put them to scale. 
Now let's see if we can find these features. More than 180 craters have been identified as a crater. So we do find those. Hotspots and large igneous provinces are also found on Earth. Some of them have a large heat blob, even reaching all the way down to the core. Remember, there is no way magma rises up from there because of the crossover depth. So it seems more likely these things formed at the Earth's surface. Large igneous provinces are associated with hotspots. Good examples are Iceland and Afar. But there is also the Deccan Traps, which is associated with the Reunion hotspot, located thousands of kilometers away from each other. Interestingly, there is this half unconfirmed crater with a diameter of about 500 kilometers, right next to the shore of India. There is also suggested that the other half is near the Seychelles. This is quite impressive, as one half is near the Reunion hotspot, while the other half is near the Deccan Traps. So this seems to be evidence that large impacts happened, hotspots and igneous provinces are related to them, and continents did move. Orogenes then, this is the largest in the world, the Himalayas. If India shifted because of a drag of magma going down, because of impacts, then is this a crater rim? It could be. We also find subduction areas around the Pacific. This is called the Ring of Fire. If the Pacific is the bombarded side of the Earth, then both the location and the properties of this ring make sense. 90% of all Earth's volcanic activity happens there, that's why it's called the Ring of Fire. Next to the conversion plate boundaries. There are some locations on Earth where we find this weird spiral shape in the oceanic crust. For example, this very clear one is at Indonesia. The spiral shapes are very similar to what we see in low pressure zones in the air. Those are due to Coriolis effect. Spiral shapes because of Coriolis effect only works with liquids and gases, not with solids. So these spiral shapes could be explained by that the surface was once liquid. Look, here's another one at Polynesia. And the third potential spiral at Greece, although I'm not too sure about this one. And then again the mid-oceanic ridges, which I've shown before. We have these all around the globe with a total length of about 70,000 kilometers. Now when people show the split-up of the ancient supercontinent called Pangaea, they show images like this. However, I think the Earth more looked like this. So that is molten lava and flooded continents, and there was really no place to hide. If this happened, then here we would have had lava flows filling the Atlantic that was opening up. And later there would be another lava flow between South America and Antarctica. Let's take a closer look. Over here is the mysterious Scotia plate, which is an oceanic plate lying on top of another oceanic plate. However, if we think of this as a liquid lava flow, then this shape makes sense. So here's the conclusion. All flood models have a lot of heat involved, and we show that for two of the leading flood models. If Michael Ord's meteorite bombardment happened, then about 6.5% of the heat inside the Earth is there because of this bombardment. But the heat distribution has never been examined in detail. The consequence of the heat distribution is that the impact caused melt below the crossover depth. Heat below the crossover depth caused the fast subduction that John Baumgartner speaks about. The shape of the oceanic crust and hotspots can best be explained by large impacts. The thermal radiation cool down time of the oceanic crust is on the right order of magnitude for the Genesis flood. The melt caused the continents to be flooded for about a year. And also the conduction cool down time calculation of the oceanic crust shows that volcanic activity cannot be much older than several thousands of years. And now we have reached the end of the presentation. Please do realize that this model is still in development and comes with a lot of uncertainties. Nevertheless, I hope to have inspired you and I hope you enjoyed watching it. Thank you for watching.